hasty or careless reader. Many of its treasures lie far beneath the surface and can be obtained only by diligent research and continuous effort. The truth that go to make up the whole, the, the great whole, must be searched out and gathered up here a little and there a little. So you're not going to find it all in one spot. You're going to have to go search for it and pick up pieces here a little and there a little. Now, back about 2008, I had heard that the King James Version was the only version to use. Now, I was still reading to a King James. My wife over here was Filipino. You know, was raised in the Philippines. English or second language, so why do you read New King James? I don't know, it's easier for me to understand. He said, we were told only to read King James. And I said, Lord, you know, I believe it, I mean, I understand, I can see it, but I don't only want somebody to tell me, just read King James, I want to understand how I can explain it to others. Here, 11 years later, he has opened it up. So the more thought, the more searching, the more you will gain. That's why it says that you need to continue your study. Don't just feel that you know that subject and say, oh, that's enough of this. Continue to study. And God is going to open up more and more to you. And if you share it, you'll even get more. It says, when thus searched out and brought together, they will be found to be perfectly fitted to one another. Each gospel is a supplement to the others. Every prophecy and explanation of another, every truth and development of some other truth. The types of the Jewish economy. What was the Jewish economy made of? Give me a hint. You're looking right at it. There's a sanctuary. That was the Jewish economy. And if we understand the sanctuary, then we can understand the scriptures. The types of the Jewish economy are made plain by the gospel. Every principle in the word of God has its place, every fact its bearing. And the complete structure in design and execution bears testimony to its author. Such a structure, no mind but that of the infinite, could conceive or fashion. In searching out the various parts and studying their relationship, the highest faculties of the human mind are called into intense activity. No one can engage in such study without developing mental power. Who here would like to be a total idiot? I not use that word, but who here would like, hey man, really today I'd like to not be smart. I'd like to be a little dumb. The Bible is there to activate the mental powers. The more you study, the more you can understand and comprehend. Are you going to get in shape if you don't exercise? It's the same thing with the mind. If you just let it grow idle, it's going to stay idle. But if you continue to think, the better you can think. It's interesting how it works. I don't understand it all, but that's how God designed it, and I believe it's proper. The search for truth will reward the seeker at every turn. The search for truth will reward the seeker. It will do what? It will reward. Who here likes rewards? So every time you seek for truth, you're going to be rewarded. And each discovery will open up richer fields for his investigation. Men are changed in accordance with what they contemplate. If commonplace thoughts and affairs take up the attention, the man will be commonplace. If he is too negligent to obtain anything but a superficial understanding of God's truth, he will not receive the rich blessings that God would be pleased to bestow upon him. It is a law. It is a what? Law. 
Does that mean the law can change? No, it's set in stone. It is a law of the mind that it will narrow or expand to the dimensions of the things with which it becomes familiar. The mental powers will surely become contracted and will lose their ability to grasp the deep meanings of the Word of God unless they're put vigorously and persistently to the task of searching for the truth. Who has to search for the truth? We do. Not go to 3 ABM, not go to your favorite evangelist. We have to search for the truth. It's okay to hear a message, but is that all we rest on? We're waiting for somebody to come in and charge us up. But here God is waiting every morning and saying, How diligent are you studying? I want to give you a reward. I want to give you a blessing, but you're not coming to me. You're only surface reading. You're not digging for the truth. And here it says what? Vigorously. You ever shake a paint can? How many times do you have to shake that thing for that thing to be mixed up? And if you don't shake it vigorously, what happens? It doesn't get mixed up. It's the same thing. So vigorously, you have to shake it. That's like the truth. You can't just go, oh, I don't care. Every couple of things, I'm good. No. You have to study. Commit yourself to study in 15 minutes, if, and then 30 minutes, and an hour. <coughs> vigorously and persistently to the task searching for truth. The mind will what? Enlarge. If it is employed in tracing out the relation of the subjects of the Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture and spiritual things with spiritual. Go where? Below the surface. The richest treasures of thought are waiting for the skillful and diligent student. It says the pure element of love will expand the soul for higher attainments. For increased knowledge of divine things, so that it will not be satisfied short of the fullness. Most professed have no sense of the spiritual strength they might obtain were they as ambitious, zealous, and preserving to gain a knowledge of divine things as they are to obtain the paltry, perishable things of this life. The masses professing to be Christians have been satisfied to be what? Spiritual dwarfs. How many would like to be a spiritual dwarf? Well, we are because we don't dig deep. They have no disposition to make it their object to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Hence, godliness is a hidden mystery to them. They cannot understand it. They know not Christ by experimental knowledge. What does it say in Revelation? They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Most of us will not overcome sin because we don't have an experimental knowledge. We only obtain to the truth like the Greeks did. What's an experiment? You ever do an experiment at school? What happens when you do the experiment? Do you learn something? But see, there are groups of people that will just sit there and conjecture and think, well, I don't think that's going to work. And they'll sit there and they'll talk about it and analyze it, but never do it. How do you know the health message doesn't work if you don't try it? You don't have an experimental knowledge of how the health message works. How can you even know if it works or not? Those who have trained the mind to delight in spiritual exercises are the ones who can be translated and not be overwhelmed with the purity and transcendent glory of heaven. You may have a good knowledge of the arts. You may have an acquaintance with the sciences. You may excel in music and 
penmanship, your manners may please your associates, but what have these things to do with the preparation for heaven? What have they to do to prepare you to stand before the tribunal of God? Many of us like to teach our children or have been taught that we need to go into the schools and get educated so that we can have a better life. Let's go to Daniel 1. Daniel chapter 1. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think Daniel was trained in Scripture? Do you think he was taught how to understand Scripture? Yes. Do you think he understood the health reform? Yes. Okay. So our problem is that we put education before we before Scripture. But what is the Bible? It contains what? Some principles? All principles. If we would understand that if our first study was Scripture, we would obtain to all these things listed. Did God give the men creating the sanctuary or building the sanctuary, did He give them understanding of arts? You see, sciences, penmanship. You know how much better your penmanship would be if you read King James Version of the Bible and understood that language? If you read Sister White's writings, who was what? Three grades? And yet some of us are confounded by what she said? Why? Because she was obtaining her lesson book from the Word of God. Now here, in Daniel 1 verse 4, it says, Children in whom, this is talking about the, the captives of Israel, it said, Children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in what? All wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as an ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So here it just tells us that they had all wisdom. They were well-rounded. Why? Because their parents had taught them the book of the law. You go back and study it out, it was about the time Josiah came on the scene that Daniel was born, or he was about one year old, and I believe his parents raised him on the book of the law, and that's why he was able to go to Babylon and stay. It says, words and acts testify plainly what is in the heart. In vanity and pride, love of self and love of dress fill the heart. The conversation will be upon the fashions, the dress, and the appearance. So out of the abundance of the heart, the uh, what? Uh, so we may talk spiritual things in here, but as soon as we leave, and we go on a, I do the same thing, we start talking about casual things. Is that because that's what it is? in our heart. It says here, but not in Christ, but in the kingdom of heaven. If any of feelings dwell in the heart, they will be manifested in words and acts. Those who measure themselves by others do as others do, and make no high attainments. Excusing themselves because of the faults and wrongs of others are feeding on musk and will remain what? Spiritual war. As long as they gratify Satan by thus indulging their own unconsecrated feelings, some dwell upon what they shall eat and drink, and wherewithal they shall be clothed. So you need more worry about temporal things than you are heavenly things. As though temporal things were the grand aim in life, the highest attainment. These persons forget the words of Christ. What? Seek ye. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Are we more focused on our temporal things, or do we really <coughs> seek first the kingdom of God? All right. 
Now, this is uh, a quote from Norman Vincent Peale. Anybody know who he was? Okay, he did a lot of self-hypnosis, but the one thing that he suggests, he wrote a lot of books. Okay, I want to bring you to the attention that, yes, this television hypnotizes people. Television hypnotizes us. But we also need to understand that what we read can also hypnotize us. So that means we have to be very careful of what we what? Read. A second major accusation of Peel is that he attempted to conceal that his techniques for giving the reader absolute self-confidence and deliverance from suffering are a well-known form of hypnosis. Is what? Is reader. <coughs> and that he attempts to persuade his readers to follow his beliefs through a combination of false evidence and self-hypnosis, disguised by the use of terms which may sound more benign from the reader's point of view. And so on. So, what he's saying is, I'm hitting these things in here, and they don't realize that they're being hypnotized. Do you think that the devil could use the same technique? Or do you think maybe the devil taught him the technique? So, we have to be very, very careful of what we read. So, who has heard of the chiastic structure? I told you about it last time, but I gave you a lot of information. So, you might have forgot about it. But the Bible is written in a chiastic form. And if you don't know what that is, I will show you this. Uh, maybe you can't see it. I don't know if you can see it from there. But basically what it is, it's a series of points, and it comes down to where this X is, and it's talking about Noah's flood. And if you can't see it real clear, then maybe after I'll show it to you clear, but it says Noah and his sons, all life on earth, curse on earth. Now if you went down to A, A is Noah and his sons. So the Bible is just repeating. It comes to a crescendo, it comes to one point, and that is God remembers Noah. And then it's going to repeat itself from the last thing it says. So J there is before X is waters decrease. And then J again is waters decrease. So you may have the same content or you may have the opposite. But it's making the same point. So that is what a chiastic structure is. And that's what we are going to look at today. And I'm going to show you that we can dig deep into the Word of God, not just surface. So how many is familiar with this? This is the sanctuary. Okay? Now we're going to see how Christ moved through the sanctuary. Because yes, we can know the Jewish economy. We can understand the sanctuary. We can understand the Ark of the Covenant. We can understand the lampstand, the altar of incense, and all the rest of the articles of furniture. But do we understand how Christ moved through the sanctuary? That every little particular shows us the way to heaven. What do you think Satan wants to get rid of? The sanctuary. Why? Because it's a template. Now, I know there's an architect here today, at least one. Is there another one? An architect. Is there a builder? Has anybody built before and worked with an architectural drawing? Now, what happens if you build stairs and you're a couple feet up? Uh, Eric told me a story last week. Come feet up. So what happens? They didn't go by the pattern. Right? Exodus 25. Exodus 25 verse 8 says what? Exodus 25 verse 8 says...
same way where? In heaven. So when we look at this, we can understand how Christ is working through the heavenly sanctuary. There's a lot of people that they believe when the curtain was torn from top to bottom, that that did away with the sanctuary. No. You know what that did? That showed the earthly sanctuary was done and the heavenly was about to be opened. That's why Christ told Mary Magdalene, he said, do not cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. I have not presented my blood. Once I present my blood, then I will, I can take worship. But right now, I cannot do that. I have to go to my Father and present the blood so that the sanctuary can be opened so that we can be saved. And so we're going to go back all the way to where? Where do you think it started? Moses. Okay. Let's look at this. A. All right. We have in Exodus, um, I believe it's Exodus 33, the last verse. I'm sorry, Exodus 31, and verse 18. Exodus 31, and verse 18. <coughs> Exodus 31 and verse 18. You know, people would complain about the clock. Back there, not working, but I kind of like it. It's not moving very fast. It was the wrong time. It's 6 in the morning, so we got to play it. It says in Exodus 31 and verse 18, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai. What? Two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Where was those tables of stone at? What compartment? The most holy place. Under the mercy seat. Was that the word of the Lord? So that was the very first word of the Lord that God gave to man after the flood. Because they were spiritually dwarfed. And see, as we go through the book of Exodus, when he gives the Ten Commandments, he says, I can't stop there because they're too dull. So if you read from Exodus 25 or from Exodus 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, he's starting to explain his law. Why is he trying? Is he explaining his law? Because he in 25, he's presenting the what? He's presenting, we just read it, 25 eight. he presents the sanctuary. So he says, I have to give them understanding of the sanctuary, but I got to get them to understand my law. And I got to get them to understand how broad my law is, so when I give them the sanctuary, they can understand how to come back to me. So he gives them the law or two what? Two tables. Keep in mind because the chiastic structure is going to go one way, we're going to get see the crescendo, and then we're going to come back the other way. And so in Deuteronomy, verse 31, or chapter 31. It says in verse 25 and 26. Somebody wants to read that for us. We're studying, so get involved. Deuteronomy 31, 25, and 26. Deuteronomy 31, 25, and verse 26, and it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the sum of the prey that was taken. Both of man and of beast, thou and Eliza. That should be Deuteronomy 30. Oh, I'm on. All right.
side of the ark. You would say on the side of the ark. King James says in the side of the ark. It was out of pocket on the side of the ark. Read the book of law. What was the book of law there for? What laws was it was in the book of law? The Ten Commandments were out of stone, but the book of law had what laws? Did they have natural laws? Civil laws? Right? All the health laws? All the laws were in it to govern the people so that they could understand. Did you know that before we had the present day hospitals, one of the things the hospitals learned over the years, and it was actually by a man of Lister, where we get Listerine, a disinfected he, they were very sloppy. They had blood all over the place. They go to the next guy. It wasn't until he read the book of the law that he understood sanitary measures. The Bible has how many principles? All. All principles. So we have in the most holy place, we have A, two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, and B, the what? The book of the law. Okay. So after Moses, it should actually be from Joshua to Malachi, we were given the what? Was the, was the first books of the Bible called? What do we call it? Old Testament. So Jesus is now issuing out his word. We do understand that, that Jesus was the one playing the role here, right? When he talked to Moses, it was Christ. Mr. White says, and here he goes from Genesis to Malachi and he gives us the Old Testament. So he issues out the Old Testament and that is actually to bring us back to the tables of stone. It was all calculated to bring us back to be able to stand in front of a holy God without an intercessor. So he gives the Old Testament. And then what's the next thing that happens? Jesus comes where? To the earth, to the courtyard. And he starts his ministry, and what's the first thing he does in his ministry? Let's go to John 1. You can see this, John chapter 1. Without Christ's sacrifice, none of this is made possible. Right. He 
you could have gave out the tables of stone and the book of the law, and you could have gave out the Old Testament. You haven't been baptized had he not died on the cross. None of this would be made possible. Now, let's also see in John 1, before we continue on, I almost forgot this verse here, but John 1, 1. So all through the Old Testament, Christ is issuing out his word to the people. He's trying to get them back to understanding who he is. And here in John 1, 1, it says what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says in 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Christ says, Fine, I give you my Word now, I'm going to come myself, and I am going to show you how you can deny self, so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And what was the first thing Christ did during his, after his baptism? <clears throat> Went to the wilderness and did what? He fasted for how many days? <clears throat> Some of us can't fast for 40 hours. Christ was trying to show you it's about denial of self. Self-denial. Don't worry about eating and drinking. I'll take care of that, Christ says. Don't worry about spiritual things. Did you know he prayed so much that his family, his own family, does everybody just says his own family worried about his health? He prayed so much for us, and yet he prayed so little. So here in Romans 6. 4 through 6. Going back to the chiastic structures. Romans 6. 4 through 6. It says 1. Therefore, we are buried with him in, by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So baptism is not just death, but it's burial and resurrection. So let's see if we kind of are understanding this chiastic structure here. So we have Christ's sacrifice, which is the crowning act, and then D is Christ's resurrection, which also symbolizes what? Baptism. So where do you think Christ went to next? The Holy Place. Okay, he issued out his word from Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament. So what do you think is going to happen next? The New Testament. Thank you. The New Testament will be issued out. Now let's go to Romans 1, verse 16. Romans 1 and verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the and then to the... Uh, you have to understand this point. There's a lot of people today that will come up to you and say, if you want a clear understanding of Scripture, you have to read the Hebrew. You have to understand Hebrew. You have to go back to the Hebrew. Now, who, who here speaks Hebrew? Who here was raised up and spoke Hebrew? Did you know, in fact, if you read Daniel 5, they could barely find anybody that even understood. 
Then both Daniel had to come in and read the writing of the law. Most of them had lost it already because why? They were in Babylon for so long. So let me tell you, friends, if you go back to the original Hebrew, is it really the original? Or maybe somebody's playing a trick on it. The point is, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in what? That's why Paul says first to the Greek, then to the Greek. But then in Revelation 12, we talk about, oh, we want to go there? Revelation 12. So we can see it from Scripture. Revelation 12 and verse 15 and 16. It says, Revelation 12, 15 and 16. I was counseled by a friend of mine to read. So I have to make sure I don't go too fast because I want you guys to follow this, right? We're digging deep into Scripture. We don't want just to glaze over it. We want to understand it. And I hope that you're being fed spiritually so that you won't think the food that is coming. Because remember, Christ was hungry, but he went to the woman at the well, and guess what happened? He forgot about his hunger. He was more worried about scripture. He said, man, I got food that you guys don't even know of. Amen? Yes. Sometimes, oh man, but in a way, let's dig deep. <laughs> so Revelation 12, verse 15, it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth held the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now Christ, for three and a half years, walked this earth, well, I won't longer than that, but it's in, in his ministry. I'm talking like, three and a half years, he ministered to the people at the age of 30. And you know what? This is a war going on, so I believe there's some dialogue probably between Christ and Satan. And I believe Christ said, I'll show you that I can raise a church in three and a half literal years, and I'll give you three and a half prophetic years to tear it down. And so for 1260 years, the dragon, the serpent, was casting a flood upon the woman. And the earth helped to swallow her up. Now that was literal. The Waldensians lived in the earth. They lived in the side of the mountain. But what would come later on would be the beast out of the earth. The beast out of the earth would come up and have two horns like the, like the horns of a lamb. But it would eventually speak as a dragon. But that lamb-like beast is known as what? The United States of America. So the earth, the beast out of the earth, also helped those that were suffering persecution at the hand of the Roman Catholic Church. They opened their doors so that they could come and have what? Religious freedom. Now if there's religious freedom, what do you think is going to come with it? First to the Jew, then to the Greek, but now he's going to translate his Bible in what language? Say it loud. Confidence. English. He's going to make one because he knows this land is going to be the one that co to proclaim the truth. So he's going to make sure that his scripture is translated in English paramount. We understand this. Okay. Let's go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. 1 and 2. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. And it says, somebody want to read this? Go ahead, Kyle. There was given me a red So, 
Lord comes to vision, gives John the vision of the what? The temple. And he says, measure it, but leave what out? Why? Why is it given to the Gentiles? Was Christ's ministration done in the courtyard? Yeah, at this time it was already finished. So what had happened was when Christ moved, guess who's coming after him? Satan's coming after him to impersonate Christ. So he, Christ said, leave it out. It's given to the Gentiles. My ministration has moved. I've already been there. I've done that. And if you're the body, you're supposed to what? Move with the head. So if the head is in the holy place, where should you be? In the holy place. So if the head is in the most holy place, where should you be? The most holy place experience. So here it says, after Christ's ascension, the court was given to the Gentiles. Those who did not move with Christ died in the destruction of Jerusalem. <coughs> you don't move with Christ, Satan will destroy you. That's his whole game. So now... What we want to do is we want to concentrate here now in the holy place. Okay? Now, which article of furniture in the holy place do you think represents the word of God? Why is that? Why? Because Christ says what? What did Christ say to, the, to Satan in the wilderness? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He says that in Deuteronomy as well. So he's just repeating himself. He, says, he also says in John 6, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And Christ is the word. So therefore, the bread is the word. And it's interesting how many stacks of bread were there. Two stacks. And how many? I get that every time. Twelve. No, there was six on each stack. Six loaves on each stack. So there was two stacks representing the what? Old and New Testament. Also represents the Father and the Son. See, the sanctuary is deep. God says it a few things, and yet it means so much. For man, it would take books to write. God writes it in very small detail. So, let's go to Revelation. Revelation 4. Revelation 4. Verse 5. Revelation 4 and verse 5. Now, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So, what compartment do you think John was looking into? You don't have to guess. It's in the book. The holy place. How do we know? This is in the text. We read the scripture and we're still dumbfounded. Seven lamps. Where were the seven lamps? In the holy place. So what is John seeing? He's seeing the holy place. And before the lamps was a what? It's in the scripture. It's open book. I'm not I'm trying to trick you. Before the lamps was a throne. I want you to understand this point. We're getting to the crux of the matter. We're spiritually dwarfed because we don't what? Dig deep. It's the word of God. So he sees into the holy place. Okay? So what is what he sees the seven lamps? are before the throne. So what is the throne? What's the throne? What article of furniture? Alright, now, easy way, you got three articles, right? And we already took away the lampstand, so by process of elimination we should be able to figure it out, right? So let's go to Revelation 8. Revelation chapter 8. I have 
believe it is verse 3. <coughs> Revelation 8. While we read this together, it may help us to understand. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So we have the seven lamps. Is what? Before the throne. We have the altar of incense. It's before the throne. So where's the throne? You have a veil there. You can't see it to the most holy place. We are in the holy place looking, and we see a throne. So the table of showbread is the throne. That's why Jesus went and sat down at the right hand of the Father after his resurrection. He's not sitting on a throne right now. He's interceding for us. That's why there's two stacks of bread on the table of showbread. One for the Father, one for the Son. After his resurrection, he went back and sat down at the right hand of the Father to do what? Remember, he gave the devil how many years to tear down his turf? 1260 years and three and a half prophetic years. He said, go ahead, tear down my church. And what did the devil do? Took away the word of God. He did everything he could to make sure the people didn't understand the word of God. He hid it from them. And so, Christ is sitting on a table of showbread, which is the throne, one of the thrones, there's two if you read Daniel, because it has wheels on it. Why do you put wheels on something, John? The move. So he sits down on the throne, and when is he about to move off the throne? What year? 1844. 1844, we should all know that. 1844, he is about to move off the throne. So what is he going to have to do? He has to issue out his word. Yeah, I would say with my son. <laughs> he has to issue his word out before he moves. If he doesn't do it, then we're lost. We don't have a word. Why? Because he moved ministrations. He's not coming back. All he has to do is once. Do we believe in the power of God? How many times do we have to have this translated? <laughs> and let me tell you, if we come here trying to study Scripture, and you've got one version, i got another version, and you've got another version, that's mass confusion. And God is the author of... He's not the author of confusion, is he? He's the author of order. read this if we're still not sure. As had been stated, the earthly sanctuary was built by Moses according to the pattern shown him in the mount. It was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. Its two holy places were patterns of things in the heavens. So there we go. The courtyard is the earth and there was two holy places in heaven. The holy place and most holy place. Christ, our great high priest, is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. As in vision, the Apostle John was granted a view of the temple of God in heaven. He beheld there seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. He saw an angel having a golden incense, golden censer, sorry, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. <clears throat> Here the prophet was permitted to behold the what? First apartment of the sanctuary in heaven. And he saw there the seven lamps of fire and the golden altar represented by the golden candlestick and the altar of incense in the sanctuary of earth. And again, the temple of God was open, and he looked within the inner veil on the Holy of Holies. Here he beheld the ark of his testament represented by the sacred chest constructed by Moses to contain the law of God. So here we can see that the first apartment is the same verses 
that I read. And subsequently, I actually found the verse before I found this quote. Because somebody, we had a study and there was a little bit of confusion, so I went back and dug this quote out. Okay, so, now remember, in Revelation 11, God tells, or Jesus tells, John to measure the temple but leave one out. Why? It's given to the Gentiles. Why? Because Christ moved his ministration. What year was the King James Version of the Bible written? Does anybody know? I heard it faintly. 1611. Now, if you study it all out and understand, it wasn't just King James. He wasn't sitting in his chamber right now. The version. Okay? It was 46, some say 46, some say 47. Scholars. Okay? He appointed that he, he didn't even want anything to do with it. When he got into his, his reign, he was like, I don't want anything to do with it, but uh, I believe it was the hand of the Lord. Because it's amazing that actually, well, after Germany, England was another one to break off of the papacy. And here Christ already knew he was going to open up the beast of the earth, right? So he prepares the king of England, who understands English already, to translate the Bible as a whole, because Christ is about to do what? He's about to move into the most holy place. This is why we have to understand the sanctuary. All those dates, all those years, all this prophecy. Like, ah, oh, why do we need to know that? This is important. We're in a war, and Satan wants to make sure that we don't understand this stuff so that he can hypnotize us. And just like I read the quote that Peel is hypnotizing people through books, what do you think Satan's doing? Everything he's in the, he's fighting for his life. You ever see a man fight for his life? Go try and save somebody drowning. They can pull you under too. Because they're fighting for their life. Satan doesn't Satan does not. If we think, ah, doesn't matter what version. Satan's not that clever. You've been working, working with a being that's been here for over 6,000 years studying us. And who knows how long it happened. And yet we think, ah, oh, you can't get me. Now, let's see if Spirit of Prophecy talks about a throne as well. So, this is actually early writings, page 54 to 56, and it's entitled, End of the 2300 Days. It says, I saw a what? A throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself, said he had. But I could not behold it, for said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Before the throne I saw the advent people, the church and the world. I saw two companies, one bowed down before the throne deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Here's the thing. This was before 1844. So who do you think the ones were that were praying earnestly? Those were the Millerites. This was the midnight cry. For many were just careless and different. They were in the holy place, but they became careless and indifferent. And when the disappointment happened, most of them stayed in the holy place. They did not go into the most holy place experience. There was only 50 of them that went in because they were praying before the throne intensely, deeply interested, while the others just stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then he would look to his Father and appear to be pleading with him. A light would come from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne, but few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light. Now, 
out. If this is taking place in the holy place, and it is the midnight cry, and we are supposed to be in the most holy place, where would the midnight cry be shining? In front of us or behind us? Behind us. Because we're in the most holy place and the holy place is behind us. Sister White says, it was the midnight cry. When she looked for the Advent people, the angel said, look up and look a little higher. And she said, the midnight cry is lighting our path. That's few. Many, actually, many rashly denied the light. And her feet were left in what? Perfect darkness. You have to understand the midnight cry is the light behind us. And Christ is the one shining in front of us. And it said, it went bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it. And their countenance shone with its glory. You want this glory? I want my countenance to shine with this glory. It says, I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil. Sister White said, there's two thrones. We just see it. I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil. The Abbasid could not be in the Holy of Holies if he rose from the throne and went into the Holy of Holies. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who were bowed down rose with him. How many? Most of those. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose. So get this, there was people bowed down before the throne, then there's people that were careless. They just came out because they're like, oh, Jesus is coming, let me get on the ship so I can go to heaven. They were careless and different. Jesus, many of those bowed down. So not all of them, but many of them bowed down and rose with him. So then she says, I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he rose. And they were left in perfect darkness. Those who rose with Jesus did keep their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. The reason they were left in perfect darkness is because they rejected the midnight drop. Instead of saying, hey, where did we go wrong? They started to make excuses. Started to change scripture. Those who arose with Jesus, uh, those who arose with Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm. What's the right arm of the gospel? Oh, the health lesson. And we heard his lovely voice saying, wait here. I'm going to my Father to receive the kingdom, keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire, surrounded by angels, came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest, where the Father sat. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of his garment was a... Bell and a pomegranate. Bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would set up their faith to him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit, that Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. Where are you going to find that? In the holy place or most holy place? You better be careful. Most holy place. So, there was only a group of people that went with Christ, but then there was the careless multitude that was still in the holy place. This is the reason that the fallen churches go and they say, hey, it's all finished at the cross. You know why? Because in paganism, they worship the east. They worship towards the east. So when you go into the sanctuary, the sanctuary faced what direction? West. So those in the holy place are looking east and they see the altar of sacrifice and they say, it's all finished at the cross. And that's why it's our job to say, no. Take commandments in this way. Turn around. So you have this little company who 
were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. And Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light. What's light in Scripture? Truth. So he's breathing upon the people truth. What is he breathing upon them? Precious truth contained in the word of God. But it is present truth that we need now. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. This is the whole purpose, friends. He wants to draw you back out of the most holy place experience. How's he going to do it? She just said, he came in. He took over. Where was Jesus sitting before he moved? On the throne, the table of showbread, issuing out his word. So if Satan comes in, what do you think he's doing? Christ had already moved his ministration in 1844. That's why he issued out the word in 1611. He wanted to make sure his people had it in full before he left. If he issued it out again, then the whole plan of redemption falls apart. The whole template is off. We have to understand this. Let's go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Actually, put your finger there. And go, before we read that, go to Exodus 26 and verse 35. We're going to see something here. Exodus 26, verse 35. Now Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by some words that proceed out of mouth together. Every word. See, when we study the, when we study the Bible, every word has its proper meaning, proper bearing on the subject. Exodus 26 and verse 35 says what? Yeah. Somebody read. Go ahead. And that set the table without the veil. And the king will sit over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And I shall put the table on the north side. So where was the table? On the north. Okay? Sometimes we just read the, the Bible and we just gloss over it. Don't understand. Now go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Now may I ask a volunteer here. Do you either use your iPhone or Android, whatever, if you don't have it. But if somebody come up with their iPhone and look up and get the NIV, because we're going to actually look through some of the scriptures in NIV. So if I can have one volunteer, unless you have the hard copy, I forgot to bring mine. And so if somebody can get it on their phone, we're going to go through a couple of texts. But let's go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, and see what it says. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. Stop there. He's going to what? He wants to exalt his throne. Which throne? There's two thrones. But which throne does he want to overtake in the sanctuary? Which one? Ark of the Covenant or the Table of Children? How do we know? Let's see. Which throne? It says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. <coughs> see, this is why it's important that we understand every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Because God is telling us, look, I put the table of showbread in the north. It's a throne. I'm going to move from that throne. And when I do, Satan's going to come in metaphorically. And he's going to sit down, and he wants to sit down upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Why? Because he wants to issue his word to you 
so that when you read it, you'll be hypnotized. So that when you read it, you'll be lost. You will reject spirit prophecy. And then eventually you will reject scripture. We're in the middle of a war, and yet we take it all. Come to church. Haven't studied all week. <coughs> and let me tell you, even more diabolical is the new kingdom. Because it's so subtle. And all you have to do, and there's a Bible in front of you, all you have to do is open it up and look at the copyright. And if it's after 1844, it did not come from the throne of Christ. Satan. Let me tell you, friends, I take a lot of flack for this message because Satan hates it. It exposes him and hates him. When you're in a war and you're trying to trick people, you don't want to be exposed. But now if somebody has their phone and can come up to the front, come on, we're going to have somebody else want to come with their King James. Now I want, I want to be in the way. I want to use doctrine. Come on up. Anybody with King James? What person? What about Come up to read. And I Who else come with King James? Raymond? Megan? Alright. You can look, start looking up about having Raymond read it first. And it's going to be Psalm 7713. Psalm 7713. Well, we're going to get it. We're going to look up a couple of things. First, we're going to start with the softer ones and we'll work up to the heart. Uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, but right now we're going to look up Psalm 77 and verse 13. Psalm 77, verse 13. And we want Raymond, if you can read, oh, I can hold it. You want to read? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Amen. What does it say in the NIV? Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You notice that? What did you notice? The sanctuary God. The sanctuary is taken out. Okay, we're going to go to Matthew 17, verse 21. Matthew 17, and verse 21. I'm just talking points. Because there's a ton. Some lady has written a book and is about that big, and she goes through every NIV scripture and shows the error in it. 17 verse 21. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting? Now, this was talking about when Christ came out of, off the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples that were left were trying to cast out a demon. They could not do it. One of the reasons they couldn't do it is because there's still selfishness in their heart. They were vying for the right hand in the kingdom. And so they could not cast out this demon from this boy. And they asked him later on if Christ said, this kind of goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now that's pretty important, right? We want to get rid of sin. So we, Christ directs us to pray and fast. What does it say there? It has been deleted out of the end. Matthew 17, verse 21. It's gone. Now, Sister White and Isaiah implored us to do what when we study the Bible. Here a little, there a little. Proof text method. Sister White says, all those that will herald the third angel's message will study the Bible like William Miller. This was proof text method. We're going to go to Revelation 22, and verse 16. Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and I am the bright and morning star. So King James clearly makes Christ the bright and morning star. Amen. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony from for the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Okay, so I know he says the same thing, right? He's a bright morning star. Who is the bright morning star? 
Say it loud so I know you got Jesus. So we're clear on that. Now go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Well, actually, just 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weakened the nations? Okay, so there it's clear. He, I mean, he gives a name. Christ gives a name in the King James. He says, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? Now what does it say in the name? How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. So who is the morning star? Yeah, he just cast Jesus down. That's what Satan has wanted to do for many, many years. And every time he's come, when he came to Christ in the wilderness of temptation, he said the same thing to him. You're the one cast out. Look at you. You're fasting. You're emancipated. You don't have any food. You are the one rejected by God, because he was trying to get Jesus to lose faith in his Father. Remember, Jesus didn't have, not, he didn't come and all the knowledge was in his head. He had to study like we do. So when he went into fast, he was led by who? The Holy Spirit led him to fast. So when Satan came to him, Satan tried to say, you're the one cast out. You're the fallen being. He was trying to break his faith in the Scriptures. Thank you, God, as you close it. So the same thing today. Satan is trying to put his identity on Christ. And he does this in the NIV version of the Bible the most. You can see it the most. But you know what? It's the subtle ones that are the worst. And if you really go out and go and study through the King James or the New King James version of the Bible, it's very subtle, but they made Christ to be just an ordinary man. We have to remember, we can be hypnotized by what we read. Remember Sister White says the books, I'm sure Neil brought these up, books of a new order would be written. Satan would write books of a new order, especially in this church, to take our mind off the heavenly sanctuary. So here we see, see the New Testament corresponds with the Old Testament. We have the 1611, the translation of the Bible, in the King James Version, 1844, Christ moves, his ministration from the holy to the most holy, Satan takes over. So, if we had the book of the law, right, we had that at the beginning, we had the Ten Commandments in the book of the law, which is point B, now what do you think point B would be here in the holy place? The spirit of prophecy by the pen of Ellen White. And if you understand this, Ellen White is actually a type of Moses. The Ellen White was called to lead the people out of sin, out of Babylon, out of Egypt by giving them the clear understanding of the word of God, taking us back to where? Where did she come to? The sanctuary doctrine. Was Moses given the sanctuary doctrine? Was Moses given the health laws? Did Moses get to go into the promised land with his people? Sister White gets to go into the promised land with her people. Does she speak of a special resurrection? Yes, she does. Was Moses resurrected and taken to heaven? Sister White is a type of Moses. And so the spirit of prophecy comes from where? What compartment? If we reject her writings, 
we're going to reject the Bible. Understand it? Because if, you, if we're supposed to, if the head is where? Where is the head? In the most holy place. If the head is in the most holy place, then where are we supposed to be? Most holy place. And God gave us the spirit of prophecy, 1844. That's why this, the King James Version was already given to us. Because he was about to move and issue out his word in the spirit of prophecy. That's why we all we have to do is look at the copy, right, of the Bible and say, well, that one is after 1844, then I'm not going to read it. In fact, I was in Wisconsin giving this lecture. I didn't have as much information as I have now. And during the break and during the fellowship meal, this gentleman walks in. He's trying to persuade us that we need to understand Hebrew. <laughs> and we need to read the Hebrew Bible in order to be saved. I said, sir, you might want to stay here. Of course, he didn't. But all I did was say, can I see when that Hebrew Bible was written? And I looked, and it said 1974. I said, you can have your Hebrew Bible back. Because I know that this one is the correct version. God doesn't need a bunch of translation. If you can't understand this, it's because you're not studying hard enough. On the day of Pentecost, what did the disciples start doing? Speaking in what? Speaking in tongues. If you don't understand this, it's because you don't spend enough time in it. By beholding, we become... It's the most poetic <coughs> version of the Bible. I guarantee you, if I ask you to quote John 3.16, guess where it's coming from? King James. It's the easiest to memorize. And so we have the spirit of prophecy as being. The question only remains what is point A in the chiastic structure? Right? That's what we have to ask ourselves. We have two tables. Then there would have to be what? Two tables. Now, most of us would think, well, it's got two tables of the SP to take matter. No, because the chiastic structure, crescendo, is with Christ's sacrifice. So, therefore, there has to be another two tables. But, that's for another step. Because, I don't want to go too much further. But the reason, another reason I'm leaving it here, is because we need to study for ourselves. And not be just fed all the time. And then we sit down and we forget all that somebody has presented. Why? Because we need to go back like the Bereans and see if these things were so. And so what I want to try to do is, is activate your mind and go and say, what is that, A? Let me go study that out for myself. Let me go see what spirit of prophecy says <coughs> about it. And you guys can come back next week and let me know if you figured it out. I want to get you guys interested in the scripture. We should sit here and be, forget about fellowship meal and let's, let's, let's dive into scripture. She says to eat light on the Sabbath so our minds can comprehend the goodness of God. I want to get out of church at what time is it? The speaker's going too long. The reason we do that is because who's ever speaking doesn't really feed us spiritually. So we get bored. Does anybody have a desk job? Anybody sit at a desk? Anybody drive something? Yeah. When you drive it or you're sitting at a desk, that's when the power of appetite comes the most. You're just not doing it. And so when it's a dry, dusty servant, most of our minds start to wander towards physical food. Because our brains are not engaged. Friends, I'm going to close on this Hebrews 5. I actually forgot to bring this up, but Hebrews 5. This is closing. And then we'll pray and we can get some lunch. 
But Hebrews 5, what's, what does Hebrews talk? What is the book of Hebrews about? Well, that's Hebrews 11. But the whole entire chapter is a condensed version of the sanctuary. Sanctuary doctrine. God had given the Jewish nation the sanctuary doctrine, and the problem is they lost sight of it. And so here comes Paul, and he's, he tells them, in Hebrew, well, he writes out all Hebrews to point them back to the sanctuary, but in Hebrews 5, in verse 12, it says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is not skillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The reason that there's so many poor sermons today is because the devil knows that if you just continue to drink milk week after week, you're going to what? Be unskilled in the word of righteousness. Now, what would happen if you just fed a baby milk the whole entire their whole entire life? What would happen to them? Eventually they'd die. Because they have to be weaned at some point to get full food. And so a lot of times we're not taught deep things in the word of God because Satan understands this, and we're just gonna be keep drinking milk until we wither away and die. And that's why in Isaiah 7 it says he will eat honey and curd, or honey and butter. So what do you have to do with milk in order to get butter? And I was talking to Christ. Honey is actually prophecy, and the curd is that milk. He just churned it until it became solid food. And that's what we have to do. We have to go into the solid food, the Word of God. Pick one word, study it out. See the reward that God wants to give us. Before you study for this week, figure out A in the past. <laughs>